you've been tracking with us, we've been going through a series entitled Firm Foundations. The verse that we've been reading, or the verses rather, are beginning in Hebrews 5, verse 11, where it says we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. The next verse says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. The idea that people need to be taught again because they're missing out on the elementary or the basic or the foundational truths of God's word all over again. There goes on to say, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. To help people move on to maturity, the book of Hebrews reviews the elementary or foundational principles of the Word of God in relevance to our relationship with Him, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. The first two foundational or elementary principles are the idea of repentance from acts that lead to death. The second is of faith in God, which we went through the first two weeks of this series. The second is instructions about the cleansing rites or the idea of baptismos or baptism. And today, we're looking at the laying on of hands. And the next two weeks, we'll end this series with the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. But for today, I want to do a quick review of repentance, faith, baptisms, which is the act that proves that we've actually, by faith, repented and put our trust in God. Baptism is the action that we take that, that shows in a physical way what we have grown to believe in a spiritual way. The laying of our hands is no different. It's the principle of seeing something in the physical that is really meant to be something that's being done in the spiritual. The principle to understand the laying of hands is what is known as the principle of first mention. When you do hermeneutics or the study of the Bible, you want to see where the first places this idea of laying on of hands was ever mentioned. The first time it was ever mentioned is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. It says, do not lay a hand on the boy. This is speaking of to Abraham, an angel speaking to him, or God speaking to him and says, don't lay hand on your child and don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son and your only son. The first time this is ever mentioned, the concept or the idea or the thought behind it is the power of God is manifested where he commanded Abraham to kill his child, and now he's saying, don't do it. Laying on of hands, therefore, is the physical manifestation of a spiritual truth. In this case, the power to take life or the power to give life. The second time we see this concept of laying on of hands is again in the concept of the manifestation in the physical of something that is spiritual. This is a picture of Jacob laying hands on his grandsons, imparting a blessing, a human person imparting the blessing of God. The third time we see the words laying on of hands is in Exodus chapter 7, verse 4. Then it says, I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. There it is, we find God himself saying that the manifested power of God in the physical realms is manifested through the laying on of hands. In this particular case, through the life and leadership of Moses. I've entitled this message, Unlocking the Divine. As we see, there's power of life and death given through the laying on of hands. There's the power of releasing a blessing, and there's the power of seeing manifestations, supernatural manifestations in the physical realm. My first point to understand this is we are saved from, to be saved for, to understand the concept where the flow of the laying on of hands as we see it in Hebrews 6 is to understand we are saved from something to be saved for something. The first thing we saw in the last few weeks is we're saved for a relationship with Jesus in his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of why God wanted you to repent, the whole purpose of why God wanted you to trust him in faith, and the whole purpose of why you've been baptized is because God has called us into a fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 also tells us, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. The idea of repenting, being in faith, and being baptized is so that we can become in relationship with the body of Christ regardless of who they may be. We are saved from to be saved for a relationship with Jesus and his body. This is an interesting reality of who 
we were saved, we were saved from to be saved for. The second thing we find is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We were saved from where we were to be saved for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. When you think about being filled with the Holy Spirit, we find a very interesting verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, Do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Interesting. It says, Do not get drunk with wine, which is a contrast to being filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 8, 5, verse 18, it says, If you are filled with wine, that is debauchery. Debauchery simply means a, a habitual excessive indulgence on food, wine, sex, or any other substance. A synonym of that is gluttony. We could be guilty of that from eating. Now watch what it says that the contrast is between getting drunk and being filled with the Spirit. The point being, when you think of wines and spirits, there is a connection. When you think wine, you are need to be filled with it. In the same way that when you're filled with wine, it affects you. In the same way when the Holy Spirit fills you, it affects you. But the truth of the matter is, whether it's wine or the Holy Spirit, you can look at it for the longest time, you can talk about it all day, or you can even hang around people who have been drinking or have the Holy Spirit. Unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit and are walking with the Holy Spirit, nothing changes. Now, the contrast gets interesting when you look at these particular behaviors. Drinking wine or being filled with wine activates a behavior we are not usually aware of or even capable of. We see people who start acting very differently once they've had a number of drinks. In the same way, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it activates a quality of living we are not aware of or even capable of living. That's the power of the Holy Spirit now being filled in us. We were saved for, from, so that we could be saved for, right? Secondly, it causes us to forego the proper behavior and care of our lives. That's what happens when somebody drinks a lot of alcohol. They forego the proper behavior and care of their lives versus someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit causes them to be sensitive to the proper behavior and care of their lives. And thirdly, someone who's filled with alcohol is confused, is impaired, is debilitated, doesn't know what he's doing. Someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit clarifies the essence, value, and the purpose of their lives. In similar fashion, when you are <coughs> drinking alcohol, you need to constantly be filled with it. Drunkenness demands ongoing consumption because its essence wears off. The Holy Spirit is a totally different matter. The Holy Spirit is an inexhaustible source of life because His power never wears off. God saves us from to fill us for the filling of the Holy Spirit. The whole point is, how do you do that? How do I get filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? Well, as we mentioned last week, be baptized. Secondly, on a daily basis, acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life every day. And finally, put yourself under His influence. In the same way that somebody who drinks alcohol is called to be under the influence of alcohol, Put yourself under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are saved from to be saved for a relationship with Jesus and His body, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Finally, we are saved for a life of good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. There it is. We're not saved because of baptism. We're not saved because of anything we've done. We're saved through faith. It's not from ourselves. It is a gift of God. Not no one can boast. Now watch this. We're saved for that for, or we're saved from our sins by faith for, for we are God's workmanship or handiwork or masterpieces created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved from to be saved for. If we understand this, then we will begin to understand why do we lay hands? We lay hands to express the very spiritual truth inside of us in the physical realm. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh. God became a human being in the flesh to show us a manifestation in the physical realm. And He made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The principle is this. God became flesh so that it can be seen and manifested in the physical realm. And we see it. That's what it means. We have seen His glory. The reason why we lay hands is because it's an expression of the spiritual in the physical. The moment we, whether that's going to a service, whether that's receiving communion, whether that's worshiping together, whether that's a baptism, as it is with the laying of hands, it is to express the spiritual in the physical. 
The moment we extend those hands, we're expressing the, in a physical way what God can only do in the spiritual. The second reason why we lay hands is to make plain the supernatural in the natural. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40. This is about the time when Jesus was praying with his disciples. When he returned to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Now, this is very interesting. These are the most amazing disciples of Jesus, and they cannot even stay awake praying. Now, here's what he says. Couldn't you men keep watch for me for an hour? And he asked Peter. Then he reminds him and says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, let me explain this in very simple terms. You cannot do and achieve what only the spirit can do. If you attempt to reach God on your own, you will fail. If you understand that God gave you access through repentance, through faith, through baptism, now you can now access and make simple or make natural the supernatural. Rather than attempting to turn the natural into supernatural, God has extended that to you. The laying of our hands is an act of that. It's the same thing. When we extend that hand, we extend the blessing. We in the natural, we extend the hand, we extend healing. When we extend our hand, we extend the prayer. That's why we lay hands on people. There's nothing supernatural about the laying of hands. It is the natural act that releases the supernatural as God sees us obey his word. Laying on of hands is the supernatural becoming very natural to impart the power of God. Mark chapter uh, 16 verse 17 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues. Now watch this. These signs, these supernatural acts will follow all those who believe. Now watch what he says. We'll, they'll drive out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes and with their hands, and when they drink blood and poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Nothing supernatural about the laying of hands. It is God's way of manifesting the supernatural and imparting His power through a natural means of laying on of hands. Finally, when do I lay hands on people? Well, when you're blessing people, when you're praying for people. When I go out and pray for my children, my wife, when she's asleep, I'll extend my hand and lay hands on her. When I pray for people, I lay hands on them because it is an extension of the faith that I'm putting, believing that God, as I do the natural, God will do the supernatural. Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 says, Then the people brought the little children to Jesus for him to what? Place his hands on them and what? And pray for them. Jesus was laying hands on people to be able to pray for. And that's no different from you and me. We extend this natural act of laying on of hands, releasing the supernatural that comes from God. Not from us, but from Him. Secondly, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, make you can make me clean. Jesus, what? Reached out his hand and what? Touched the man. I am willing. And he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. The laying on of hands is not the supernatural work. It's the natural work that as we do that, God releases the supernatural. Luke chapter 13, verse 12 says, When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you're set free from your infirmity. Then what? He put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. It's not the extension of our hands that heals the people. It's the supernatural work of God. When do we lay hands? When we're speaking a blessing, when we're praying for people. Secondly, when we're imparting a gift or office or calling, when we're speaking and setting people in a particular destiny or calling or office, we lay hands on them. Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, there's the Holy Spirit, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. There's a particular call and a destiny for every person and human being. So after they had fasted and prayed, they what? They placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is the idea behind the laying on of hands, to impart that gift, to impart that blessing, and to set people on their course and their destiny and their calling. Now, there's a warning in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 22, do not be hasty in laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Do not be hasty in just imparting a gift or an office or a calling to people as it is warned in the previous verses in 1 Timothy, because you need to be not a party to the reality that those people might not be qualified for the reason why you're laying hands on them. Finally, when to lay hands on people? 
to with a, when there's when you're imparting a blessing, when you're praying for them, or when you're imparting a gift, office, or calling. And lastly, when you baptize people in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verse 17 says, Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. What's a fascinating thing about the way God works is He uses simple things. Repent, which is to turn. Faith, which is to trust in God. Baptism, which is to immerse in water. And finally, the laying on of hands. So that we can impart a blessing and pray for people, impart a gift, an office or a calling, and to baptize them in the Holy Spirit Himself. Let me summarize this message for you. We are saved from to be saved for. A relationship with Jesus and His body, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, a life of good works. Secondly, why do we lay hands on people? To express the spiritual in the physical, to make the supernatural natural, and to impart the power of God. And finally, we are, wh when do we lay hands on people? When we're blessing and praying for people. When we're imparting a gift or office or calling. When we baptize people in the Holy Spirit. Join me in a short proclamation of Jesus as you pick up your bread and your cup. Lord Jesus, thank you for just the wisdom of these elementary truths about your kingdom. Repentance from acts that lead to death. Putting our faith in you. Having ourselves baptized in water so that we can be empowered to be those who can lay hands. And instead of being those that are contaminated with evil, we are the ones who are now imparting the gift of the Holy Spirit to humanity. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.